Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, June 7th, 2024. This week, Rex Hewerman has been charged with two more murders. Italy is still obsessed with Amanda Knox. And the Karen Reed trial goes off the rails. All this and more, eh, stay tuned. Yes, super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner. Suspects that James Renner has zeroed in. James Renner's once again... Drops a bombshell. Investigative journalist Renner. reporter Renner. James Renner, who's been James on the podcast Renner. a long time. Friend of mine. James Renner. And welcome back to True Crime This Week with me, your host, James Renner. There's the James Renner bell. Welcome back. I missed you last week. I was out at Crime Con in Nashville, the bachelorette party uh, capital of the world. At least that's what they told me. Um, I didn't get out much other than the convention. It was great to catch up with some old friends and uh, meet some new people. Um, met lots of lots of people there this past weekend. It uh, it went very well. We were at the Opryland, which is a weird, huge hotel, and I got some good barbecue. Uh, saw Chris Hansen, and he didn't ask me to sit down, which is always a good day. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, yes, happy to be back here, and this is a, a big week in true crime. But first, uh, as always, I want to thank Walter for manning the camera. Uh, Walter's just back from a trip to Reno, where he uh, got his marriage to Gypsy Rose Blanchard annulled. Uh, they just ran into it. They just got into it way too fast. You know, young lovebirds, they do what they do. So, um, anyways, like, like I said, big True crime news uh, this week. Uh, it's, a, it's a big week for true crime news. Um, you've probably been following some of these cases, but let me give you the, the top stories and some updates and some cold cases. Let's get to it. Let's not waste any more time. There's a lot to talk about. Here we go. New York City architect Rex Hewerman may go down in history as one of the most prolific serial killers of the 21st century. On Thursday this week, Hewerman was charged with two additional murders on top of the four he was already charged with, according to CNN. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to charges of second-degree murder in the 2003 death of Jessica Taylor and the 1993 death of Sandra Castilla. He was previously charged in the murders of Melissa Barthelemy, Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Each of these women worked in the sex trade and their bodies were found along a stretch of Long Island known as Gilgo Beach. They were able to catch him after an examination of those bodies revealed hairs that were matched to either Hewerman himself or his wife. Now the wife's hair may be what we call transfer DNA where he transported these bodies in a car that his wife had previously been in and we lose hairs all the time falls onto the onto the chairs and then uh, the seats and then it gets onto the bodies as he was moving them. Hewerman's attorney said that his client was surprised by Thursday's charges stating that the architect is quote in a bad place in terms of the new charges end quote which I find a little weird. Uh, they've already got you on four murders. Are you really that upset about two more like like I was really upset <laughs> about the first four murders but it was the last two that really got me. Also, it's quite possible he's going to be charged with more murders in the future. As many as 11 bodies were found on Long Island near the sites where he allegedly dumped his victims. At the hearing yesterday, Suffolk County Prosecutor Nicholas Santa Martino described some of the things detectives found at Hewerman's home and on his computers after recent searches. They say Hewerman had created a Word document on his laptop in 2000 that he used to organize his instructions to himself on future kills and how to avoid getting caught. Hey, here's uh, rule number one. Uh, don't create a Word document about your murders. Uh, the Word doc included details about how to clean the body after death and how to transport the bodies to a dump site. They also found a trove of disturbing pornography that included torture and bondage dating back to 1994. That's back in, like, he had to be sitting there as they, you know, back in those days, you had to wait for those things to download, you know, an inch at a time. 
This guy was dedicated. It's clear that uh, investigators are taking a hard look at Hewerman's past and combing through other cold cases that he might be responsible for. The murders for which he is charged came after he was already in his 40s, but as one law enforcement official told CNN, quote, in most cases, a serial killer does not start killing in his 40s, end quote. The truth may be that we will never have a full accounting of the evil that this one man unleashed on our world. Really disturbing case. So listen to this bullshit. Uh, on Wednesday, Amanda Knox was reconvicted by an Italian court for slander, according to the Associated Press. As you probably remember, if you're a fan of true crime, Amanda Knox was a 20-year-old foreign exchange student from Seattle who was studying abroad in Italy in 2007 when her roommate, Meredith Kircher, was brutally murdered in their apartment. Knox had a good alibi for that night. At the time of the murder, she was over at her boyfriend's place. But after Meredith's body was discovered inside a locked bedroom, police focused on Knox in an almost obsessive way. Knox was, after all, an American, a foreigner who could barely speak Italian at the time, and she was young. All in all, a perfect target for what the police did to her. Knox was interrogated for hours and at least once was hit by the police during that interview. At some point, the pressure became too great, and she gave them a name, the man who employed her, Patrick Lumumba, an allegation that she quickly recanted. But of course, the real killer was neither Knox nor Lumumba, but a man named Rudy Gade, whose bloodstained fingerprints were found on bedding under Meredith's body. That's pretty... I mean, you don't get better evidence than that. But even after the, the Italian police and prosecutors had that evidence, they still continued to go after Knox. Um, she was somehow convicted of murder and sent to an Italian prison for nearly four years before cooler heads prevailed and she was released. Then, in 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Italian, the, uh, the Italian police had violated Knox's rights while interrogating her. Uh, duh. Right, uh, which, which led to her first conviction for slander against Lumumba being tossed out. But with the ruling this Wednesday, it seems the Italian judicial system is saying that even though Knox's statement regarding Lumumba was clearly coerced, too bad. She's still guilty. The actions of the police violated her human rights, but she's on the hook for how she reacted in the moment as a 20-year-old young woman in a foreign country who could barely speak the language. The conviction comes with three years in prison, which Knox will likely not serve due to the time she already spent incarcerated in that backward country for crimes she did not commit. Um, personally, uh, as a personal aside, I've gotten to know Amanda just a little bit. Uh, a couple years ago, she reached out and asked me to do a series of interviews for a podcast that was going to be about the Moore Murray case and how it was represented in the media. And I think it did about five hours of interviews with Knox and her husband, her husband, Christopher uh, Robbins, Robinson. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, she strikes me as a very good old school journalist. Uh, the, as unbiased as you can get, you know, no journalist is 100% unbiased, but she, she heard both sides there and she was very sympathetic and she was able to actually uh, organize kind of a um, uh, mitigation, a, a coming of, of <laughs> together of the minds between myself and the Murray family, which has been very difficult. Um, but she was always very kind, and the interviews went well. Of course, the podcast never aired. Um, there were some things going on behind the scenes, I believe, and uh, more Murray's sister ended up doing her own thing. So... But anyways, my experience with her was, was just great, and uh, her, both her and her husband, uh, they do good work on this podcast called Labyrinths, which if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. Uh, she talks about this week's ruling on the newest episode of Labyrinths. So um, another thing that disturbs me about the Amanda Knox case is you go online, I did a quick search on Twitter, and you see the, the incels that are responding to her being reconvicted of this, this slander and just using it to like degrade and, and bring her down some more after everything she's been through. So man, um, you got to have thick skin to, to go through all of that, but uh, wishing her the best. 
This was the sixth week of trial testimony in the Karen Reed case, and it's really starting to look like, at least to me, in my humble opinion, the conspiracy theorist might actually be right this time. Uh, Reed is standing trial for the death of her husband, 36-year-old John O'Keefe. A, uh, actually, I think that's 46. He was 46. John O'Keefe, a Boston police officer who died in the Boston suburb of Canton in the early morning hours of January 29, 2022, according to The Hill. Now, if you're a true crime fan and you have not caught up on the Kieran Reed case, that is the case everybody's kind of obsessed with at the moment. You need to do a deep dive, but let me try to summarize best I can. O'Keefe was going to hang out at a party hosted by a police officer. Reed dropped him off at the house, and he never returned home. His body was found outside that house the next day. Now, the people inside are saying he never came in, uh, which is a little sus. Um, and prosecutors are alleging that Reed actually dropped him off and then struck him with her vehicle and left him to die in the cold. There was snow. We're talking late January. Very cold outside. Reed's attorneys, however, believe she was framed by someone at the party who beat O'Keefe to death and then took his body outside to stage the crime scene. The crux of the prosecutor's case seems to be a damaged taillight on Reed's SUV. Now, this week, a forensic scientist with the Massachusetts State Police testified that small amounts of clear and red plastic material was taken from O'Keefe's clothing that were consistent in color to the taillight from Reed's vehicle. Compelling? Sure. But in reality, this case is a complete mess. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what the defense has discovered. At the party the night of O'Keefe's death, uh, there was another man there named Brian Higgins, who is a federal special agent with the ATF, and he is alleged to have had a prior romantic relationship with Karen Reed. The homeowner, the guy that was hosting the party, was a man named Brian Albert, and he had allegedly expressed hostility to O'Keefe before. And if anybody knows how to cover up a crime, it's police, right? Uh, earlier in the trial, a witness named Jennifer McCabe took the stand. McCabe is the sister. Follow me here. McCabe is the sister of Nicole Albert, who's married to Brian, who was hosting the party that night. It's Brian and Nicole's house. We're talking about her sister, Jennifer McCabe. Cell phone records show that McCabe conducted a Google search at around 2 a.m., the morning that O'Keefe died for, quote, how long to die in the cold, end quote. Now, if that text was really sent around 2 a.m., that was before O'Keefe's body was even discovered. Discovered. She says this, but her defense is that the phone records are just wrong. Sorry, so there must be a glitch somewhere. They're just wrong. Oh, and remember Brian Higgins, that special agent who was flirty with Karen? Well, uh, he was also at the night, uh, the party that night, and he took the stand last week, and, and he admitted to getting rid of his cell phone in the days following the homicide. Uh, Higgins is alleged to have removed the cell phone SIM card and then getting rid of the card and the cell phone in separate dumpsters at a military base. Doesn't seem suspicious at all, right? Uh, he, now, he, here's my problem with the case, and it's purely from a um, somebody that studied crime and written about crime for about two decades, two decades now. Um, still fairly young, I guess, in that field, but, you know, here it is. Uh, has there ever, in the history of murder, been a case where a woman drops off her husband outside a house full of police and special agents and then taking the opportunity to murder him with her SUV and then fleeing the scene without getting caught, going home and going to bed? Has that ever happened? Uh, so what's more likely? Are we dealing with a one in a million crime here? Or is this some sort of cover-up? So that's where I'm at with the case. Follow the Karen Reed trial. Uh, I do not see how they convict this woman at this point, but we'll see how it shakes out. Boston is a town that loves their police, and uh, they're full of uh, jurors who I'm sure know, know people in the system. So anyways, that's the top stories. Stay with me. I've got updates coming up, including what uh, Gabby Petito's mother had to say at CrimeCon, and uh, we're going to get in the, into the Hunter Biden case. So I'll be back in two and two. Please hang up and try again. And we're back with Double Trouble, starring Gene and Liz Segal. A bit of news out of CrimeCon last week. Nicole Schmidt, the mother of Gabby Petito, spoke at the annual convention. 
She had some surprising things to say, according to W. Uh, DSU. As you remember, 22-year-old Gabby Petito was murdered by her fiancé, Brian Laundrie, in 2021. At the time, she was traveling the country with Laundrie, and she was missing for several weeks after he returned home alone. The case was all over the news and social media for months, all anybody could talk about. On September 19th, Gabby's remains were found in Wyoming's Bridger Teton National Forest, Then Brian himself went missing. He was later found to have died by suicide, and he left behind a notebook in which he admitted to her murder. Now, speaking to a crowd at CrimeCon over the weekend, Schmidt said she forgives Brian Laundrie for killing her daughter, stating, quote, I need to release myself from the chains of anger and bitterness that I refuse to let your despicable act define the rest of my life. And then she went on to call Brian's mother, quote, pure evil, end quote. Addressing Brian's mother directly, Schmidt said, quote, You do not deserve forgiveness. You deserve to be forgotten, end quote. Gabby's parents had sued Brian's parents for emotional distress, alleging they knew that their son had killed Gabby, they knew where her body was located, and withheld that information. Hunter Biden, the son of President Joe Biden, was on trial this week on three felony charges relating to obtaining a firearm in 2018 while addicted to drugs, according to ABC 13. On Wednesday, prosecutors called two of Biden's ex-girlfriends to the stand. Zoe Keston testified she observed Biden smoking crack a few weeks before he purchased the gun. She said he used crack every 20 minutes or so. That gets expensive, even for crack, right? Uh, Biden's ex-wife, Kathleen Buell, testified that Biden was sometimes angry and short-tempered when he was on crack, but he managed to function normally otherwise. The defense has claimed that uh, Biden was not addicted and that there is no such thing as a high-functioning crack addict, which is a weird defense. Uh, The trial continues, but could wrap up as soon as next week. The moral of the story here, don't do crack. Don't do crack, kids. The Guardian reports this week that 67-year-old Michael Mosley A well-known doctor who has appeared on TV shows in the UK has gone missing after going on a walk on the Greek island of Simi. He was last seen hiking along a beach at 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday. A search team on their way from Athens with drones and other equipment, uh, they're on their way from Athens with drones and other equipment to aid local authorities in that search. So the search gets bigger every day. A local police chief said they're working on the assumption that Mosley might have been affected by the heat and possibly slipped and fell from a height. In the U.S., to put this in perspective, this would be like if Dr. Oz uh, went missing while taking a hike along Malibu Beach. It's very weird. Keir Johnston was sentenced to four and a half years in prison yesterday for attacking his wife, according to the Daily Beast. Who's Keir Johnston, you might ask? He's the guy who went viral a couple years ago after posting a picture of his mother-in-law's dress, which sparked a worldwide debate over whether the the dress was blue and black or white and gold. It's blue and black, people. If you're seeing white and gold, you're nuts. Um, Johnston was recently found guilty of assault. Uh, He threw his wife to the ground, strangled her, and brandished a knife during the attack, by the way. Luckily, she survived. And this all stands as the worst ending for a meme since Bad Luck Brian won the Ohio Lottery. Let's jump over to weird news, shall we? The ex-husband of a Real Housewives of New Jersey cast member was convicted on Tuesday on charges he hired a mobster to assault her new boyfriend, according to the Associated Press. Thomas Manzo was found guilty of conspiracy, falsifying and concealing documents, and committing a violent crime in aid of racketeering activity. He was married to Dinah Manzo, who appeared on Real Housewives. He faces up to 46 years in prison. Federal prosecutors allege that Manzo hired a guy named John Perna, who was a soldier in the Lucchesi crime family. That's one of the, that's like, you know, you're getting into Sopranos territory, to assault her boyfriend with a slapjack in exchange for a free reception for Perna's wedding at a restaurant co-owned by Manzo, which is about the most New Jersey thing I've ever heard of. Over to pop culture. 
The new season of Bloodline Detectives, hosted by Nancy Grace, is currently streaming. Are you watching it? Uh, I love it. It's all about genetic genealogy. Um, her production company has announced they'll be back for season five, which will include a special 100th episode. Hosted by the preeminent legal firebrand and famed prosecutor Nancy Grace, the series explores years old cold and more recent cases which are being solved using genetic genealogy and familial DNA. Integrating key witness testimony with new forensic and genealogy expert interviews, plus reconstruction and archival footage, uh, Bloodline Detectives is a study in modern and futuristic crime solving techniques. If you're a true crime fan, you should be watching this. Check it out, Bloodlines. This week's book, the book of the week, the true crime this week, book of the week. That's a little clunky. We're, we'll, we will work on it. Um, the book this week is Death in Old Mexico by Nicole von Germenten. Uh, here's the write-up. This is going to be for fans not just of true crime, but of history. It's uh, an intersection. It's very, very unique. In a Mexico City mansion on October 23rd, 1789... Don Joaquin Dongo and 10 of his employees were brutally murdered by three killers armed with machetes. Investigators worked tirelessly to find the perpetrators who were publicly executed two weeks later. Labeled the crime of the century, these events and their aftermath have intrigued writers of fiction and nonfiction for over two centuries. Using a vast range of sources, uh, Nicole von Germenten recreates a paper trail of enlightenment era greed and savagery and highlights how the violence of the Mexican judiciary echoed the acts of the murderers. The Spanish government conducted dozens of executions in Mexico City's central square in this era, revealing how European imperialism in the Americas influenced perceptions of violence and how it was tolerated, encouraged, or suppressed. An evocative history, Death in Old Mexico provides a compelling new perspective on late colonial Mexico City. If that's your jam, you're going to want to pick that up. Uh, and that's the show for this week. There'll be more true crime next week, I'm sure. I'd wish there wasn't. I'd wish we'd have a week where there'd be like, what's happening in true crime? No, nah, everybody was nice to each other. Sorry, we're going to take a week off. And that's not going to happen. We'll be back next week. Uh, in the meantime, go out and celebrate. It's beautiful outside. Um, climate change has made Ohio very, very uh, nice in early June. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, anyways, um, in the words of the incomparable Murray Saul, the godfather of Cleveland Radio, we got to, 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 get down, damn it. True Crime This Week is a fearful symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.